to the next slide. Perfect. Well, hello and welcome to Antioch University New England's Conservation Psychology webinar series. My name is Dr. Krista Daniels, and today our presentation will focus on five principles of co-designing conservation with, not for, the community. And as I mentioned before, next slide please. My name is Dr. Krista Daniels and I will be your moderator for today. I am a senior associate, associate and faculty for the Center for Climate Preparedness and Community Resilience at Antioch University, New England. Today's presentation will include this brief overview, approximately 40 minutes of presentation by our speakers today, and then the 15 minute Q&A section. As the presenters are speaking today, please do make sure to share any clarifying or content related questions in the Q&A box below. I will be keeping track of those questions throughout our presentation. And in the last 15 minutes, I will read some of them aloud for our presenters to answer live. You can also write questions after the presentation. In respect for your time today, I will scan through all of your questions and post the presenters those questions whose answers will be most helpful to the type of audience we are seeing here today. So to help me with this, I'm asking you to please start any questions you write in our Q&A box with either the term educator or researcher or field conservation or whatever term best describes you as a professional. That will help us with fielding all of the questions. Next slide, please. I would also like to alert you all to the next one credit online course. It's called Climate Justice and Equitable Adaptation. It will run four weeks from April 5th to May 2nd and it's asynchronous. It is part of our Climate Resilience Certificate Program at Antioch University. And it's important to note that you can take it for one credit, no credit, or just audit the course for professional development. Next slide, please. And now to introduce our presenters. Dr. Kayla Cranston is Director of Conservation Psychology Strategy and Integration at Antioch University, New England. Kayla applies her expertise in long-term behavior change, working across cultures and biodiversity conservation. For the past nine years, Kayla has, been, has most extensively implemented her research in the zoo and aquarium world. Joining Kayla today, as you can see in the pictures, is AmeriCorps alumna, uh, Daria Keyes. We are very lucky to have Daria with us today as she will be bringing a perspective to this presentation that our webinar series does not normally have the privilege of hearing firsthand, that of a resident who was born, raised, and currently lives in the community that a conservation program has impacted the most. Daria was recruited by Kayla to serve as an AmeriCorps research associate at a local conservation organization where she and four of her fellow community members worked directly with Kayla and her research team to shape the questions and methods guiding the organization's co-design of educational programming with their community. Take it away, Kayla. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Krista. Hi, everybody. Um, Daria, say hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, we're very excited to, to have you all here today, especially amid all of the craziness that's happening right now. Um, so we are going to go through the first few slides really, really quickly, and then we are going to slow down at the end and hopefully have enough, well, we, we will, we will have enough time for Q&A. So what you'll notice in the few first few slides, though, is that this presentation was conceptualized, created back in early January of 2020. And so this was before COVID even existed. So you'll have to excuse us because what's happening is we are going to be presenting um, principles that you can follow when you're interacting with communities in the future, right? Like, so, we, you know, when we're allowed to stand closer than six feet from each other. So <laughs> that's what's happening right now. Um, and so, you know, we are in this place of, of, of deep kind of solitude right now. So thank you all for being here. But also I just wanted to share that what came to me about this presentation and the timeliness of it is that during this time, I don't know about you, but it's become really, really clear to me if it wasn't before that the conservation of biodiversity 
is absolutely like in, in, inextricably linked to human well-being. And the two really, one can't happen without the other. And so conservation makes more sense, right? Then in that case, when we are working with the community to support both conservation goals and human well-being goals. And so that's what we're gonna do, uh, talk about today. And so as you navigate this new world of ours um, and all of the uncertainty that we are currently experiencing, we are hoping to give you a, a little sense of, of the strategies that have been proven by science to work um, in that type of complex situation. And so, right, so we're here for you is essentially my, my point. And so when you go into your next Zoom meeting after this call and your boss kind of looks at you with like a, you know, scared look and is asking you about how can we fund conservation after this and let's come up with some ideas, this presentation might be helpful um, to, to tell him that there are, there are strategies out there that have been proven, they're evidence-based. And you, you went to a webinar that talks all about them. So, um, right, so that, that, that's that. Let's see, what's my next slide? Oh yeah, okay, so here's the deal, guys. We are starting this presentation with a framework that has been around for decades. So um, this is a quote from my dissertation. I, I did this in 2016, but before that, I mean, it's based essentially a, on a lot of work. Um, just one that I'm mentioning here is Diane Russell and her colleagues kind of put together this idea that conservation professionals need to relinquish their role as leaders of environmental work and instead strengthen their capacity to act as facilitators of participatory processes that you, you know, support co-design of conservation with not for communities who are most impacted by it. So that's the basic framework for which, from which we are, we are um, coming at this topic from. What you'll notice and what's important about the language here is that this part that I've highlighted in red, we are talking about strengthening your capacity to act as facilitators right? Like that is the charge. It is not the charge to learn about how everybody else has done it, what their results were, what their solutions that they came out the other side with, and then copy and paste those to your own solution. That is the opposite of what we want to do. And so we are going to be focused on the participatory processes today. I will not be sharing with you today any of the results from any of the many case studies that we'll talk about. And I just want you to know that that is, that is purposeful. So why? Great question, glad you asked. Um, so here's the deal, lesson of, of the corn doll. So right now I work at Antioch, but previously I worked with Carol Saunders since 2011 on the uh, development of the Conservation Psychology Institute. And absolutely every single year, the majority of our students at the Conservation Psychology Institute were from the zoo and aquarium world. And so I had the opportunity in 2013 to sit down with one of them who was having a little bit of an issue, right, uh, with her field conservation project. The issue was that she was out there working in, uh, with communities that bordered a protected area in Bolivia. And her company, her company, her organization, conservation organization, big one, wanted to make sure that the animals that lived in that forest were safe, therefore needed the forest to stay put, stay where it was and not be destroyed, right? So the solution that they came up with was, um, we are going to, so the, the issue was that, that the community was taking wood from that forest and they were using it to create things to sell, right? And so her solution was, we're going to get them to stop doing that and instead offer them an alternative economic way of making a living, which in and of itself, we'll talk about that later. But what was really interesting was what she said to me about why it wasn't working, right? She said, you know, Kayla, I don't know what to do. There's, a, a, we've given, we want them to make these little corn dolls. And so they've got a little picture of what a corn doll looks like. If you've never seen one before. Um, and so we give them all the supplies and, and we teach them how to do it. And then, you know, a month later we come back and all the supplies are just laying there. They're not being used. We don't know what's going on. And um, I said, okay, well, first of all, 
your story is very similar to a lot of conservation organization stories over the years where they begin to attempt to do something without asking the community first what they would like to do. Um, and in this case specifically, when I probed for where this idea came from, she said that it had uh, come from a case study that she heard about in Canada, which is apparently where these uh, types of dolls exist in reality and are based in the culture of the Native American populations that live there. So not based in the culture of the Bolivian populations that she was working with, but in a very honest, you know, uh, mistake and things that, that happen a lot, which is that we have the best of intentions and it's just human nature to want to move forward quickly with something. And so we reach for the solution that another community has created and we attempt to apply it to um, a different community with um, not many good results. Why? Why doesn't that work? really, really quickly. There are a million reasons, but I've mentioned just a few here. Practical, do they even have corn there? Like what's going on? Economic, who knows if there's ever even a, a market for these dolls, even if they could do this. Political, cultural, not the least of which is psychological, which if you can think of yourself as a human being told to do something that did not come from your own mind um, in any way, shape or form, there's this thing called psychological reactance, and we're just not going to do it for a long period of time. And so my uh, dissertation research was uh, really focused on how we can um, how we can go about creating that longer term change that I think all conservation organizations are looking for. And so. Um, Right, so that's the lesson. So even if I were to be able to give you the, the results here, it wouldn't really help you because the truth of the matter is, is that um, a lot of institutions, funding organizations, as well as uh, our known and love AZA are starting to catch on to this fact. And the truth is, is that um, the more you can learn about the strategies that you could use or the principles that you can use to direct your own strategy and how to do this and how to create a culture specific, context specific solution for the issue that you're running into, the more funding you will, you will be able to find. So that is, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and so really quickly, to give you some context of where I'm coming from um, with my knowledge on this topic. Like I said, I worked with the Conservation Psych Institute. I've also had, during that time, a lot of amazing opportunities to work with diverse community in the United States. Um, in my postdoc, I also worked with a community of fishermen and homeowners in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, my doctorate uh, was focused on a, a network of a few hundred educators or professionals that were across five different countries in East Africa. And so uh, today we're gonna dive a little bit deeper to give you a little bit of a sense of, of exactly what we mean um, in a case study that recently happened at an organization that I was um, employed at. And that is where I met Daria. So the one thing that you need to know about this, uh, this community that we were going into for that project is that it was several hundreds of thousands of people. So very different than the ones I had done before. However, I had faith in the participatory process and we were able to move forward uh, creating this with parents, service providers, educators, and teens in the Midwest of the United States. And so what I will say, is that how in the world did we do this, right? So here's kind of the main gist of the presentation today is that as you can imagine, and as I'm sure your experience tells you, there are many different communities, many different strategies uh, that you could use in those communities. And the question always becomes, how do we, how do we do this? And to what extent do we engage the public in the development or co-design of our conservation projects. And so I am here to tell you today that it has been my experience and my uh, dissertation research results, which you see in front of you there, that there are five main principles that help us move towards a situation where everybody that is in the co-design process is in it, right? There's ownership, there's autonomy, there's efficacy, there's a real community demand for what we're doing. 
and everybody that we need to continue to have ownership over this process over time so that they continue to do it, all of those folks have some type of, of self-regulated understanding. So what you see in front of you are some of the, um, the survey items from the, the instrument that I created to measure whether or not this is happening. If that's at all interesting to you in the end, we can talk about that. But I wanna move forward uh, rather quickly to just show you how this might work in the real world. Okay, so what you have in front of you is a co-design conservation model. It was based and adapted from Driscoll 20, uh, 2002 with uh, what you'll see as I add to it is that we also added some things from McKnight and Kretzmann. We also added some pretty, uh, you know, typology of participation. This is what I found useful when I was doing uh, work in all of the communities that I've worked in. So what I will say is that, um, again, this is uh, kind of adapted from Driscoll, and this is the basic concept that Driscoll came up with, that there are three main circles, main um, phases, if you will, that you want to go through. The first is that green, um, that green circle here, this identifying the issue. You want to co-design that with your community is basically what he's saying. Um, the other, and when you're done with that, then you want to go into strategic planning, which you will also want to co-design with your community. Pilot testing, which involves them as well, all the while doing monitoring and reflection throughout this process. And the idea is that the people that you're engaging, suggested by Driscoll, were residents directly impacted by the project. So people in the community that are gonna be, maybe have the most to gain or, or are gonna be the most affected by what you're doing. Professionals that are already in that community that already serve those residents um, are also stakeholders that you need to take into account. Any kind of governmental officials that are around or more official officials, if you will. Um, and what I added to this in my own experience over the past uh, nine years is a little bit of a, a different um, take on it. So identifying the issue, there wasn't much explanation given by Driscoll about how we wanna do that. And so I pulled in McKnight and Kretzman and essentially um, what it's an asset-based approach. So the four questions that you wanna be asking your community are what is already working in your community as opposed to what do you need, right? The difference between an asset-based approach and a needs assessment is you're starting with the question is what is working? Uh, what are the community goals that you have there um, that, that the community already has outside of your organization or your wants and beliefs? Then what can we design together to reach those goals at the same time as, as meeting, reaching conservation goals? And then probably the most important piece, what are we unable to do? Absolutely unable to do. Um, as a conservation organization, we have limits. Um, some of those in, say, for instance, the education world might be along the lines of, you know, the community residents really, really want us to help them increase test scores. However, um, the truth is, is that that's not what zoos do. They might do it indirectly, but that is definitely not a part of our mission as a zoo or an aquarium or any conservation organization, really. Um, and so we want to make sure that that is stated up front so that nobody gets um, any kind of misguided idea of what we're supposed to be doing there. It really does help with reducing the amount of um, upset at the end if you, in fact, don't do the things that they didn't even know you didn't do. So there's that part that I added. The other part that I will say um, that's important is that so Driscoll does include this thing about how whoever's doing this process needs to build the relationships and their capacity to build those relationships with uh, these profession or these stakeholders over here. I will also add here that it has been my experience that if you don't put in just as much effort <laughs> into creating that type of relationship and capacity among your own colleagues um, as a larger organization, this type of process is going to fall flat on its face. And we'll go into uh, how to do that in, in the coming slides. Let's see, right. So the question I always get when I present this is, Holy crap. Okay. First of all, how long does it take? What are the resources that are required? How much time? What's the timeline? What's the, what's the budget? I mean, all of that, right? 
And the question, and the way that I answer that is that it depends, but it's not a general, it depends. It's a, in my experience, in my research findings, we've shown that the amount of time, resources and space and, and um, all of that, that you kind of allocate towards this type of process is completely dependent on who you are engaging, how many people there are, but most of all, whatever stakeholders you have, the stakeholders that you want to continue to be engaged in the process over time, not just when you're done with the first step, um, those people have to be able to feel from the very, very beginning um, about, you know, they have to be able to feel those things that we talked about earlier, those psychological uh, things. Right. So the meaningful ownership, the effective autonomy, the community demand, demand the group efficacy and on you. Or um, that's like, you know, they like actively revolt against you. And that is something we don't want. So um, that's what you got to keep in mind. So it doesn't matter really if you are uh, doing this process in a way where you start with the stakeholder analysis and then you do participant observation and interviews and focus groups and then you do listening sessions and then you do, like whatever methods you use, it really doesn't matter. Whatever you're doing, and this is one that I am suggesting for a larger uh, community, the one that Derry and I worked on together, um, and we'll go into the details of that soon. Um, but don't worry, if you're not working with several hundreds of thousands of people, you're working with a smaller community or a more intimate community, um, you're still gonna have these folks, right? You're still gonna have these types of stakeholders. Um, but your process might look a little different. So for instance, in the farming example, uh, we actually had a situation where the farmers and the service providers, there was no weird power dynamic. In fact, if anything, the farmers had more power than the service providers. So we combined these two steps, and I can tell you about how we went about doing that if you're interested. Um, uh, this? Oh, yeah. So if you have a super small, right, like, so if you have a super small a community that you're working with, or even a medium-sized one that for some reason you have an established knowledge of the different stakeholder dynamics, then it is possible if you ensure that these things are being hit, that you can move right into your participatory event. And so again, we'll move forward quickly through this, but I, if you want to know more about it, I'm just suggesting that no matter what you're doing, you're asking these four questions. Yeah, to all of those types of things. All right, man, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the long and the short of it. And so, Daria, you and I are going to talk a little bit about how, what this looks like, what these, these five uh, guide, guide, guideposts look like in the real world. And so we'll start here with community demand. And the idea here is that our com um, you want everybody that you're working with to feel like our community could really benefit from whatever it is you're doing right now. That seems to be super important. Um, within the conservation organization, I can tell you that what this looked like for me was that when I was working at a large conservation organization full time, I was a researcher, right? Like that was my job. And I was asked by the executive team to figure out how you can create effective educational programming in a new community that we had not necessarily created programming directly for in the past. Um, we were moving to a new location, there was a whole situation, catalyzing event. My request was, can you do a needs assessment? How are we gonna create uh, effective education programming in this community? <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, okay, you guys, I am in the middle of urban Midwest United States. The racial tension around here is just, you can cut it with a knife. I am a white girl from Arizona. There is no way that I personally know how or what the community is doing right now, what, the, what we could potentially build on. Like, I know nothing about that. Less, least of all, do I know about their needs. So, 
I remember stating out loud, I need to talk with the people. The question then became, how do you do that? And that's when I started applying this process. Um, what I will say is that when you are doing this as a conservation organization nowadays, um, this might not be why, right? Your, your demand that's coming from your community right now, especially might be more opportunities where prospective funding is likely. So remember when we talked about before, right now it's obvious that humans and nature are kind of inter interconnected in a very intricate way. And uh, funders, donors, as well as federal are looking at this going, I'm gonna need you to include that community well-being in your conservation plan. So that might be one way of answering the question, how are we going to continue uh, funding conservation during this crisis? Um, all right, man. So this is, this is the part, oh, this happens before stakeholder analysis, I should say. Um, so Daria, I want to flip it over to you now so that you can talk a little bit about the community demand as it had to do with the residential community. I think we can all agree that the ideal here is that the community asks you to come into their community and do something specific. In our situation, that wasn't necessarily the case. They had asked us to come in over and over again. This was a big, much bigger engagement that we were going in for. So um, instead of that being, what does the reality usually look like, Daria, in your experience in your community um, when organizations come in without there already being this ideal we want you to be here immediately. Come. Um, usually kind of met with distrust, you know, if a big organization moving to your neighborhood and there was no previous relationship, they're kind of wondering like, you know, what is your purpose here? So you have to be genuine and be sincere when you're first starting that out. Yeah, I, I think like it can be met with mistrust. So you have to come in with like a Switzerland approach, like, hey, I'm just trying to find out what is it that's needed and we're here to be your neighbor. Yeah. And it sounds like that was something that AmeriCorps taught you a lot about. Did you yeah. learn anything uh, in your AmeriCorps training that taught you anything about kind of maybe the history of your, your area and whether or not something like this had happened before? Yes, uh, we weren't, I'm sorry, we learned in one training, uh, an AmeriCorps training, an organization that came to the neighborhood and they're like, we want to give you guys a tire garden. And all the neighborhood officials are like, no, that's okay. We really don't need anything like that for our neighborhood. And they're like, no, it's okay. It'll be great. You know, it'll look great. It's going to be an awesome time. So they started building it and it turned out it wasn't that great. And instead of removing that, they just left it there and it became an eyesore. And it's like, they didn't listen to that community need. Yeah. Okay. So in your opinion, what was the community need if it wasn't directly being asked for? What was the community need that that became apparent um, as you started working with us on this project? They just wanted us to be involved. Uh, make sure that you communicate what's going on. You don't know what they need, so it's better if you ask and take the time to get to know what are the assets, what are, what are the things that are important to them instead of going off of, oh, this is what I think is what's best for this neighborhood. You don't know right off that. All right, okay. Yeah, thank you. And just to clarify, the uh, the tire garden, that was not a part of anything we were doing. That was like more of a historical story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that unfortunately, this community had dealt with um, that type of approach um, in the past. And so we were coming in under that, that, that energy really of like, are you gonna take advantage of us? Is there going to be gentrification in this area because you're here now? Like it's a whole thing. So just keep in mind, that's where you have to start, you guys. You have to start there before you start doing a stakeholder analysis. Figure out the history of the area you're going into and be sure that it's front in your mind when you're going to ask people to be a part of this project. All right, so meaningful ownership, seeking the guidance that is meaningful to the community and is essential to the process. So, right, within the organization that you're working with, Again, it kind of comes back, at least in my experience, to the executives. So what is meaningful to them? Um, what I found to be most useful is that if there's anybody on your executive team that is actually from that community, you want to, um, you want to make sure that you are engaging them early, early on. And so, right, and so the... Um, 
you want to make sure you're engaging the executives that are perhaps already knowledgeable about that community that you're going into. Um, and so that was kind of where we started and have started in the past. Uh, it's also a good idea to create a structure to listen to all of your staff and your managers who care about whatever community it is that you're working with. Um, and so at this point, you're kind of running up on your stakeholder analysis. The idea is that you gather all this information from these people who care, you put it in a spreadsheet and you hand it over to an objective third party. And the idea here being a university or somebody else who's not a part of your organization, um, being able to do that stakeholder analysis uh, with you or for you um, really helps this meaningful ownership piece on on all sides um, and then of course last but certainly not least we want to hire residents who know the community really well and what i want to say about that is that um, it is not a coincidence that we ended up hiring daria and four of her colleagues who were from the area that we were working with in fact uh right when at the very start of this i was asking around all of the executives what you know, who are the people that I need to be talking to? Who's gonna be really pissed off if I don't talk to them early in this process, right? Um, and that's when I was introduced to an individual who really knows the community really well, has been there for their entire life. And that person invited me to a community association meeting at, um, in, in the, the town that was closest to where we were working. And so that's, uh, that's how I found Daria. Daria, do you want to talk a little bit about how you found me? Uh, a lifetime, a long family friend was going to these meetings and that's where she met Kayla and she was like, Daria, this will be a great opportunity for you because I know that you want to uh, work in social work. And I reached out to Kayla and basically, um, the, all the work that I did over 2019 really hit home with helping people and reaching out and making sure that I got in touch with everyone who who matters. Like everyone wants to feel included and matter. So AmeriCorps really put me on the map. Yeah, able to do that. So that was the text message that um, your aunt sent you right there. <laughs> yeah. It's really speaking directly to uh, Daria's uh, personal passion interests which makes a lot of sense, that's the way you go. Um, and so as kind of somebody who was already interested in social work, what was the way that you went about um, finding out what would make this most meaningful to people? I reached out to any and all people, senior citizens, teens, uh, teens in risk youth detention centers, just any and everybody. I tried to make sure that I got in touch with all the people I could, churches, school events, soup kitchens. There, was, there wasn't a place that I didn't go to make sure that everyone felt like their voices were heard and they were able to be a part of the project we were doing. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a story about a soup kitchen that would be interesting right now or is that another slide? I can't remember. I know, this is this one. Uh, we were at a soup kitchen and we were giving out surveys to again, find out what types of educational programming would be relevant for the youth and the overall people in that uh, community. And the, the woman I was speaking to thought that she was like, oh, it really doesn't matter what I think. And I was like, no, everyone matters. I was like, you, you don't know what, what could be you know, useful. I was like, so just tell me like, what do you think is most important for you and your kids? And she was like, okay, yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll write some things down. Right. right. So that was during a, a part of this process that we'll talk about in a few slides, but um, I think suffice it to say that it sounds like you were finding the most meaningful um, context and the people who would find it most meaningful with those who might be able to gain the most from something educational being in their community um, on top of what was already already there. And so, good. All right. Anything else you want to say about meaningful ownership, Daria? I'm good. You said okay. all the things, Kayla. <laughs> Okay. Um, right. So talking about me saying all the things. Holy moly. All right, guys. So how did we get started? Um, so this is where self-regulated understanding goes in. Uh, you could say, and I have many times, that in this specific example, we were really going in, a lot of us, with um, a basic understanding of kind of what had already been done in that community 
And within the conservation organization, it was really important for us to start with that. So for instance, these community, um, what are they called, town hall meetings is, is kind of what we were doing. And we started with that, um, obviously you see me there presenting to a very large group of, of folks. And this was just like one part of, of many of these that we did. And so, um, so we had Daria at this, uh, this was actually our first, right? Our first event together since, uh, after we hired Daria and her colleagues. Um, and each of them were sitting at different tables in this community room. And at the end of, of just presenting a general synopsis of what we were up to, I had all of them stand up and introduce themselves. And, um, and so I want to just uh, ask Daria to elaborate on what happened in that first meeting. Um. Initially, I was reading the room just trying to see how everyone felt about our presence being there. Uh, like, and that it's not all the same for every community you go to. Some people are excited, some people are just kind of like, okay, what's going on? And we just learned. Uh, Kayla told me to take notes and write down questions. And that first meeting set the framework for how, I guess, how other people react in future meetings we went to. They just wanted to know who it was for, what type of impact it would have and uh, who the program, programming would or could affect. So that first meeting uh, really set up like how to handle other meetings and know how to answer questions after that. And then if there wasn't a, a question I could answer, I knew who to go to after that. Right, right. So Daria actually is being a little humble here. She actually came up with an entire way for us to go about doing this while we were in this uh, first meeting. She wrote down a bunch of questions, came to me, asked me, I said, I have no idea. These are really intense questions. Let me go to our higher ups. And so that's exactly what we did. We sent those questions up the, up the, the flagpole, if you will. We got answers to them answers that the conservation organization was comfortable writing down in print. And that is the level of comfort that we really need to build here to make sure that the higher ups at your, at your, I almost said university, at your conservation organization are really feeling comfortable <laughs> with these folks from the community um, going out and actually uh, um, talking on behalf of your organization. And so uh, that's what we did. And we got back um, some of those, those answers and we gave them to Daria. And here is when I started um, realizing that once that basic understanding, that ability to not just know what we're supposed to say, but also correct their own mistakes, right? Like if they have a question they don't know, they get to go to that Q&A thing. If they really don't know, and neither do I, then we go somewhere else. Like that whole process, once we're feeling comfortable, they're feeling comfortable with that, then at that point in this process, that is the time, and I'm talking about right at the very beginning, phase two, is when I start sitting down. And so um, this was something that came to me. I'm not you know, coming into this with great experience in large crowds doing this type of thing. So it came to me kind of by accident. And specifically, there's a wonderful story that I would love uh, Miss Daria to share with us about when this happened for us, when it became clear that I was no longer the person in the room that needed to be talking. Um. We went to a apartment manager's meeting. It was uh, very close to the where the conservation organization location where it was going to be at. And Kayla was presenting and, you know, telling, telling everyone what the project was. And one lady in particular, she just wanted to know, she's like, okay, so the programming that you have at your current location, is it going to be the same here? And Kayla was like, yes and no, it's going to be different. And when that woman heard different, she heard a watered down version thing. And she was like, why can't it be the same? And Kayla used a big word like echelon. And it just, it, it came off to the woman as when I hear different, I'm not hearing the same. I'm hearing, you know, it's not going to yeah. be as good. So she yeah. got really upset. So after that meeting, I followed her and I told her, I was like, I, I want you to understand. I was like, when she says different, she means different in the way that we're getting our input to create this content. We can't create anything unless we have input. Not different as in 
you know, it's not as good. Different as in the way that we're going about creating it. We need your input. And there was a relationship formed after that meeting. She gave me her card and she allowed us to come back to her apartment complex and give surveys out to her residents to help us uh, advance in our research. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a real story that it really happened. And it wasn't the the first and it wasn't the last time that um, you know, the, the the community really holds holds you accountable as a researcher. And if you're able to kind of pivot like that, it really helps the entire project. And so it became clear at that time to me that Daria and her colleague um, who was also from that area was at that meeting was actually the one who stood up and stopped me from talking like literally was like Kayla let me just um I'm gonna and then he rephrased what I was trying to say because here's the thing about being the project manager of an AmeriCorps project where you also have to talk about this stuff to the conservation organization executives is that it's really, really hard when you're going from one to the other within the same day to make sure that you're not using the same language. Um, and so that was the issue that I ran into. So it became clear to me at that point that I, I needed to kind of hand over the reins. And so how we did that uh, is kind of, well, it's a big, it's a really, really big story. But we essentially were able to, um, what am I doing here? Oh, fun. Okay. Yeah. And so what we were able to do is that from then on, I will say in the conservation organization, we decided to track who is going where, right? So my job immediately became, instead of being the one who was leading the process, I was um, facilitating the AmeriCorps members um, leading the process. And so decided, like I decided, well, we decided together who was gonna go where based on where their previous relationships already were established, tracked that. I mean, you know, I, I like a spreadsheet. We tracked the heck out of it. Uh, we leaned into the staff strengths. And so what that meant was that Daria is an amazing person and her skill set specifically lies in paying attention to detail is what I learned very quickly. And so we really relied on her to pick up on some nonverbal communication that was happening at all of those meetings. And she would bring that to the table when we would all meet together. Um, and so we did, we met, we met together with uh, the university partners that we had, that we were working with, and the rest of the research staff that was working with me from the conservation organizations. Um, and I'm gonna have Daria tell you in just a minute about what this face right here is all about. Um, but before I do that, I will just also say that um, it's important to keep that communication going early and often with the executives and the managers as well. I will tell you, it was not very, very often that the higher uh, ups were coming to our, our every week meetings, right? Like that was just not something that they had time to do, honestly, even though they wanted to. Um, and so it became clear that it became important for me and my colleagues to go to them and to go and present at their you know, strategic uh, meetings and, and tell them all about what was going on. But um, this picture right here was actually not taken in one of those meetings. This was taken in a meeting that we were having with our university partner. Daria, do you wanna explain the faces that we got going on here? Yes, those faces scream, are you serious? You got to be kidding me, what on earth? Um, so in that meeting, we had been sending emails to officials like city clerks and mayors and asking them to pass it along to the residents in their neighborhoods to get them involved in the focus groups we were creating for that project. And at that meeting, we found out that no one had signed up from the people we were assigned to reach out to. So it's kind of shocked and, oh, wow, no way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we ended up physically going to them and asking about and making sure that we knew their unique community barriers that were um, going to stand in the way of us having them come to us, right? So we go to them first. And then as you know, in this, uh, as, as is true in the, the uh, listening sessions and the focus groups, we are uh, doing those in their community, like in a space that's there, but we are physically asking them to go to somewhere where they're not already going. So. Uh, to get them to do that, we had to consider barriers like uh, 
you know, transportation and childcare and um, we did give them incentives. And so I can go into all of those unique barriers if you're interested, but I'm noticing that we are um, coming up on 15 minutes left for Q&A. So I just kind of want to say that basically the idea here is that effective autonomy happens when you can feel, you and your team members can feel like you are effective at what you're doing and that you don't have to be told what to do. You don't have somebody over your, your shoulder telling, telling you what to do. And so um, that was kind of the process by which we all created our own effective autonomy and doing so really helped us um, foster that same feeling in our community uh, that we were interacting with. Because if you physically meet them where they're at, it is, clo it is easier to kind of uh, co-design anything with them um, and, and have them feel at, like effective partners in doing so. So the last thing that we'll talk about today is group efficacy, which is continuing to engage after the identify the issue phase. Um, and so group efficacy is essentially saying, I might have effective autonomy. I might have my self-regulated understanding. I might know that my community is demanding this stuff. Um, and I might find it meaningful personally or professionally. But as a group, if I don't feel like I'm being, I'm effective part of a larger group that is working effectively, then I am less likely to continue working with that group over time. And so we're going to tell, uh, talk a little bit very quickly <laughs> about um, some of the ways that we did this within our community. Daria, do you want to talk about um, the if, how thing? So a lot of uh, what I heard from the community members while doing uh, my research, they just want to be included. Don't come into the neighborhood and not explain what your purpose is there. Keep them updated on your progress. And in one of our meetings, uh, someone was like, okay, well, we can go to local libraries and, you know, maybe have a movie night or create a newsletter or just, you know, invite them out to the property, have like lights next and just, you know, this is where we are right now. Here's what's going on. Just make sure everyone wants to be included. And if you're coming into a neighborhood that you've never been in, that's only right that you make sure what's going on. They make sure what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, and you absolutely. Want to keep that presence uh, consistent and always positive. Yeah. Um, perfect. Wonderful. And I think what is important for me to see from the, the kind of conservation organization side of things is that this does not come easy, obviously. Everything we just talked about for 40 minutes <laughs> happened in this first phase, this identify the issue phase. Um, the good news is, is that there was funding, the funding that um, I went out and got to support this project did allow for a second and a third year of, of work. And so that, uh, that can continue. But as you can imagine, um, as an organization, you have to feel like you're working together effectively for that to actually continue um, over time. And so that's kind of what I want to say about that. <laughs> and um, I think we just want to end on advice from the front lines. So go ahead, Daria, take it away. Uh, the main thing that I want to push home is be a neighbor, not a savior. You're not there to save anyone. You're there to create something for the betterment of everyone, yourselves, and the people that you're uh, working with. And it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay not to know the answer to everything. Um, and it's okay if like you haven't addressed that need as long as you're taking the steps to address that need, that's all that matters. Always be a neighbor, not a savior. <laughs> Hashtag neighbor, not savior. Um, okay. So I wanna end with some advice from um, the administrative side of things, which is that this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work and it's really, really, really important. Um, in the context of COVID, what's probably going to happen is that there's going to be a lot of concern about how we as a field are going to move forward with conservation work funded while the majority of our country is focused on the health of the humans around us. What I want to just put up here is that there are funding organizations like the ones you see here that are interested in funding this more participatory co-design of conservation work, especially if you can connect it to the human uh, well-being goals of the community. So I strongly suggest we move forward. Um, and so 
Yeah. And so, oh, right. Um, you move forward with that. Oh, yeah. And AZA. So uh, what I'll say is that um, I was recently asked to come and be an advisor um, at a social science advisory board meeting for the next 10 years of social science research that AZA is going to going to put together. And we told them all about this. And um, it seems as though there is a general sense that this is becoming more and more important, even at that really top level. So that's pretty exciting. If you want to talk more about that, let me know. Um, oh, right. We've got coaching available. If you want to do this um, in your own organization and want some assistance, we have a coaching um, group that's starting on, on April 6th. So please reach out to me. We're also doing research across the country right now to scale up this model. I have a partner that's already um, signed up to do this with me in uh, the Pacific Northwest at an AZA accredited institution. And we just got a lot of funding um, to, to support the scale up of this. And so it's really exciting. Um, if you are in California, Washington, New England, Boston, um, any of those places specifically, please get a hold of me if you're interested in being a part of this because that is where we have campuses and we can help you directly. Um, okay, I think I just wanna, wanna stop. I just wanna stop and answer some questions. Thank you to the many for faces of uh, accountability that I've run into over my many years of working in communities. All right, um, so Krista, dear, dear Krista, <laughs> um, let's just say we're going to go over. I know you were texting me and I'm so sorry. We're going to go over because we're already over or we're getting there. Um, what I want to say about the questions that we can't get to today, I will be answering some of them um, in writing and we can post that up with, uh, with the, the recording. Mm -hmm. But I will also say that in this, with this kind of context, it really is easier if you just call me or email me, which is why my email address is right there. And, and we can talk more about how to apply this type of thing to your context. Um, or if you want to help us with applying it in a larger context, please let me know. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Daria. Um, so just time for a few questions and then we'll get to the others offline, like we said, uh, outside of the webinar. I think one just quick question I know the answer to that's pretty easy is folks were really interested in getting some of your citations and your dissertation work and some of that. So if we could maybe put that on the website, I think that would be easy or you direct them where to go to find those publications. That would yeah. be fantastic. Yeah, then, I know mm -hmm. I shorthanded it here, but um, so yeah, the full references I can definitely. Yeah, that, that would be great. Okay. What else? So one thing that seems to come up with a few folks, which I think is really good, is um, specifically uh, lots of times people who are impacted by a project can't attend community meetings. And in particular right now with not being able to do face-to-face, um, mm -hmm. This might have mm -hmm. even more resonance for folks. Are there other ways to include their voice and needs? Have you thought or worked through some of those oh, yeah. uh, infrastructures to be able to do that? Yeah, man. Great question. Great question. So we actually did run into that um, when we were working through this specific case study. And um, the truth is it does not matter where, con what context you're in, any kind of participatory process that you create is going to be exclusionary in some way. It just is, right? Because especially in this case where we had several hundreds of thousands of people in this community we wanted to engage, there's no way we could get all of them um, to come to any meetings that we put forth. Ain't nobody got time for that. Let's just start there. Um, and so the way that we, we kind of handled this was that we did invite them to these focus groups, these listening sessions. We gave them incentives, childcare, transportation, the whole nine. But even then, there were a lot of folks that couldn't make it or it just didn't work out for some reason. So this is where this part comes in handy. After each phase, um, the this when you're you're oh jesus when you're trying to talk to people who are directly impacted so in our case this was uh parents teens folks who would potentially be using the educational programs like paying for them after we after we created them or co-designed them um 
we invited a lot of those folks to our in-person meeting, but when we, we knew that we had to get other people too. So we, we sent out surveys. And here's what we found out about the surveys really quick is that especially with the parents, the teens, everybody like that, you have to be really, really intentional about your survey methods, which is how I just can't even tell you how useful our AmeriCorps members were on telling us how to do the surveys. So originally our university um, partners suggested we do them all online, but as you all know, not everybody has online service. And so, um, you know, we ended up having to, to hit the streets. We literally took the surveys out and, and marked them off. And uh, Daria was really, really good at that as well as, as her other um, AmeriCorps members. And so we did that process, that survey process at the end of each of these phases. So at the end of the focus groups, we put together everything we knew, um, learned from the focus groups and put um, some options in a, in a survey for others to, to share their opinions about. And at the end of the listening sessions, which we did with a huge group of service providers that were in the area that already served this group of parents and teens, um, we also sent out a survey to the larger group of, of service providers that were in the area. So um, in, the, in the context of COVID, you guys, I mean, I guess online surveys is gonna be the best way to go. However, please do keep in mind that not everybody has that type of access and get really, really creative on how you are going to um, get those back. Um, one thing that pops to mind is is mail, right? But who knows? Who knows if that's even a thing that is possible? So thanks for the question. That was a good one. Great. Um, one other question that seemed to come up um, was how you handled any power struggles, especially, Woo! yeah, especially dealing with, um, you know, different leadership um, and different maybe political dimensions at play in a community that you're in. Are there any tips and tricks for that? Yeah, and I see who that's coming from. Hi, Eve. <laughs> um, and so I think uh, what I wanna say about this is that it's completely different dependent on your context. In this community we were at, the community residents, the, the parents, the, the um, service providers had had a history of being um, kind of put upon, <laughs> uh, disenfranchised to put it lightly, but the truth was is that through that process they felt, they felt like they were able to, to speak up louder at meetings and things like that. So um, we did find that a lot of them were able to, to actually have more power than some of, of even um, you know, other like government officials. For instance, in one of the communities, there wasn't even, I mean, it was unincorporated. There were no mayors. It was just, you know, so we, we had to really lean on the power of the community members that were there. Um, what I will also say is that even in that situation, there's going to be somebody who doesn't feel like they have as much power. Um, for instance, there was an immigrant community that was not feeling powerful to, to stand up and talk in, um, in these types of community meetings, even in the focus groups. So we ended up doing a focus group just with them that was in their, their native language, whatever that was. We did two. We did two that, uh, that were specific to the populations of immigrants that we were finding in this area. And so um, it was easier for them to talk in a space where all they were they're doing is talking with people who perhaps like English was not their first language. So that helped with some of that power dynamic. One-on-one um, -on -one interviews really helps with that kind of thing. And we can talk about that later if you're interested. What I will say is that this is gonna be a completely different story if you are in any other country. Um, in my experience in East Africa, I was taught by my fantastic advisor, Beth Kaplan, that many times um, as a white person in Africa, you're working with a bunch of folks who are born and raised in the Albertine Reef, you know, Reef East Africa specifically. Um, and it was her experience that most times if you're sitting in a small group with these folks, to get them to lead the way, to lead the conversation, to really engage, there was definitely a time where you as the white person, the only white person in the group, had to push yourself back from the table, get up and walk away because there is this like power dynamic going on um, between at least what we found between white people and, and the people who were born and raised in the area um, where if there's a white person at your table, they're supposed to be leading, right? So you literally have to get up and walk away. And that was one tactic that we found to, to work. Um, and 
had them collect their own thoughts and, and share them with us later. And so that was, that was one way to do it. There are many different ways that you can do it, I'm sure, um, in different cultures. But yeah, great question. Great, and I, I don't think we have a lot of time, but um, two things that did come up uh, quite a bit, and maybe we can keep this answer short and some things will be more um, explicit offline, but um, funding, obviously. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Ideas for funding, and also I know as people have heard, it makes a difference between how large the community is, but funding and realistic timeline. Yeah, great question. All right, guys. So funding, um, AmeriCorps is where it's at. Specifically right now, we, we actually just found a private donor who's really into the community piece of this stuff. So um, we found a really big contribution from that private donor, but we are going to match it with a contribution from AmeriCorps very soon, hopefully. Um, and so they are definitely going to be on your side in this kind of thing. I am also uh, have, have a, a source that's telling me that IMLS is really into these kinds of things. Um, so look into that. NSF is definitely starting to look at th this type of thing. I also have other ideas, but I'll share those with you offline if you want to connect with me. I'm happy to workshop uh, some ideas with you. Um, and what was the other question? I guess that's it, right? The, the, oh, timeline. So um, identifying the issue. This, for the big community, hundreds of thousands of people, that took a year. And I budgeted and timelined out for the strategic planning and the pilot testing to take the same amount of time. So it was a three-year project um, of, of continual integration. So I hope that answers the question. I'm happy to answer any other questions offline. Were the, Krista, were there any questions for Daria and her around her experience at all? Well, I think this one goes to both of you and it's a good one to end on. And then, like we said, we can answer other ones offline at another time. But um, what would each of you have done differently? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna let Daria start. Mm, what have I have done differently? Oh. I don't know, I feel like, well, this is my first time doing a project like this at all. I wasn't sure how to do it, but I, I realized quickly that, um, again, people just like to be included. And we, we actually did an exercise. We invited the community members back to the new property. And we were just asking, if you came here to this organization, how would you like to spend your time as a family? And everyone just kept saying that they loved the fact that there were so many updates. They loved the fact that they did this exercise with them. Just keep everyone included. So I don't know if I would necessarily have done anything differently, but I do know that if I come across this project again, I'd like to mirror what I did in 2019. I feel like that gave us the best results. I feel like the community really, like they were, I, out of the all the people that I met, there were a handful of people that didn't trust what we were doing, but overall it was met with positivity and I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad we're doing this, you know, it's about time. So yeah. I think yeah. I just mirror what I did again. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'll just get real with you guys for a second. And my last note here is that um, there's a reason why I was going into such depth with the way to create, you know, and foster these types of psychological feelings um, within the organization itself. Uh, it turns out that I needed a lot of practice on how to do that uh, within the organization. And I was uh, really lucky that doing this, um, I reached out to somebody who was outside of the organization that, that knew how to do participatory stuff, participatory research. And um, what was really great was that the, the, the time when I decided that I wanted to move on and come to Antioch and scale up this type of process across zoos as opposed to just staying at one institution, um, that was exactly the same time about four months before that we ended up hiring that person um, as the lead of, of not just this project, but a large portion of our organization was then led by that person. And so I felt really grateful that I had reached out to that person. And um, I'm also really grateful to the, the staff and the managers that were, that were able to kind of move in that direction and kind of create that ownership for themselves. And uh, when I wasn't always great at, at engaging them in that process. Um, so uh, I think the lesson learned there for me is, is make sure that you do it better next time. Make sure that you really do engage the, all of the staff 
and all of the managers, especially the people that had been there for decades um, throughout the process. So that's my answer. Well, I think we're over time now, so it might be time for us to end, Kayla. There are, um, you know, a few questions that I think would be easier to answer either in a document or just quickly with an email or call to you. There's a lot of specific questions on types of questions you use in your Likert scale or very specifics, I think, for people actually trying to move forward with something like this um, that I think we could be answering offline at some point. Um, I think... Yeah. Um, we've gotten to yeah. a lot of them glummed together so we can move forward. Yeah. Fantastic. Krista, thank you so much for helping us with this. And Daria, as always, man, really awesome having you and really having uh, to be able to do this with you has really been an honor. So thank you very much. Thanks and, for including um, me, Kayla. Yeah, man, we'll uh, keep you updated on how things are going. And if some of these questions are for you, we'll definitely uh, make sure we send those over your way. Okay. All right. Thank you, ladies, so much. Um, have a great day, everybody. And I think that's it. Bye.